Test one, two, three, good. Check one, two. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Anybody here for the first time? One, two, a smattering. Hi. Well, I hope this turns out to be a a worthy adventure today. <clears throat> I, uh, since I was last with you, I've spent several days in the hospital and had two new holes drilled in my head. And uh, it was very successful. They found a brain. <laughs> <laughs> they also found a lot of old blood that they drained. And uh, they say it may be done, but you never know. The, ins the uncertainty of being alive is etching itself into my experience. Um, I, <laughs> I got halfway here this morning and I realized I'd left my guitar at home, so I, it's just a small brain hole, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I thought we might visit this beautiful, the single most translated and beloved document in the Buddha's teachings, the Loving-Kindness Sutra. And of all the aspirations we could have, and there are so many things we could aspire to, this, this teaching on universal well-being, that, that our relationship first to ourselves, and then to our loved ones, and then outwards in concentric circles to include everybody, to, to include the person we think of as the enemy. And uh, I heard a really beautiful teaching from Ajahn Sumedho one time, the most senior Western Thai forest tradition monk. Um, he said, he's quite funny, he said, Don't mistake loving someone for having to like them. <laughs> and you can love someone dearly while you call the police. And you can love someone dearly when you set a limit and say, I never want to see you again. But it's what we're doing in our own heart and how we're creating an enemy image of this person that has to do with loving. So it's a great relief to, to get clear on that, that there are people in our lives that we'll never like. And we might strive 
deeply, even at the cost of our lives, to stop them from implementing their plan or their actions, their intentions. But to, to do it with as much love as we possibly can, just remembering a, there was an interview I read with a uh, youngish fellow, he was 35 or 40, who was one of the Dalai Lama's uh, chief bodyguards. I've been around the Dalai Lama on several occasions, teachers conferences, and he travels with serious security. And uh, he has his, his <laughs> I refer to them as the Tibetan goons. There are, there are these three or four really muscular guys that precede him. That we were lined up 220 Western teachers at a con teacher's conference in at Spirit Rock, and um, he was coming out and shaking all our hands, touching us as he went by, and before him came these serious guys, and if you were too far forward, you were quickly a foot and a half back. It was like, <laughs> move back. And then um, there were the American um, security guys, two or three, four, that I saw, and then there was the Secret Service, and then there was, beyond that, the local police. So he, he traveled in a bubble, because the Chinese would like, would at least then, probably still would have liked to do away with him. Um, why am I saying this? <laughs> I, loving, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, doctor. Uh, <laughs> I'm taking an anti-seizure medication that makes me really quite dull. It's difficult. Uh, anyway, um, this fellow was interviewed in one of the Buddhist glossy magazines, and the interviewer said, would you, would you in injure somebody in order to protect his holiness? And he said, well, yeah, of course. And if you had to, would you kill them? And he said, well, yes, that, would, that could be my job. And then he said, well, how can you do that, given your Buddhist background and so on? He said, well, I would always try to do anything I needed to do with as much love and compassion as I possibly could. And I couldn't allow someone to hurt the Dalai Lama. And it's a very interesting perspective, I think. So this sutra... It's, been, it's the most translated, and, um, and I think it's self-explanatory in its words, but, but as an aspiration, what do I want to become? I want to become loving. I want to live my life in as loving a way as possible, and beginning with ourselves, which then means accepting everything that we're experiencing. Because anything that we're experiencing that we are in rejection to, there's, there's a tension in us, and we're not present with it. Ah, rather strong itches here sometimes. So, uh, you'll notice there are little marks in here, little downward chevrons and little upward chevrons, and they're just a note higher and lower. So I'll do the first line, uh, the one that's in parentheses, and then please join in as makes sense for you. <clears throat> and reflecting on the meaning. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm, and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do 
the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world Isn't that a beautiful aspiration? Even as a mother protects her child. Having been a stay-at-home dad, I would perhaps make that even as a parent. Even as any loving adult would protect a child put in their arms. One of my absurd fantasies has been for a long time that before Congress or any deliberative body like the UN has a meeting, they have to pass a baby. Right? You have to subject yourself to the power of that vulnerability. We couldn't behave the way we do if we did that, I think. So, here we are, sitting. Sitting in these mysterious alivenesses. We like to think of them as our own, as me or mine. And They're clearly not that. At best, they're on loan. So with great love and curiosity, let's come home to the life of the body. <clears throat>
Notice the contact of the body with the chair or the floor. <clears throat> the earth pulls us to her with gravity. Notice the aliveness that comes from clothing touching. Arms, back, chest, legs, clothing. And in this moment, and since the moment of your birth, that moment when you took that first gasping breath, there's breathing. And with just a little bit of intentional effort, we can notice that each breath has a beginning. There's a beginning and then there is a rising to fullness. And it's nothing we have to imagine. It's actually what happens with the breath. There's a rising to fullness, and then there's a descent, a decline, until the breath expires, until it's finished. And then there's sometimes a pause in which one can be aware simply that awareness exists. Or you could choose to pay attention to the hands at that point. And then before long, a new breath begins. And the sensations of breathing exist only in the present moment. <clears throat> there is no prior breath or future breath. There's only this one now.
this intention to stay in the body, aware of the body, illuminates whenever the mind goes into the past or future, when it creates the past or future. And so we can choose to come home into the present rather than be lost in fantasies of a past or future. present present for the entire breath and simultaneously aware of the impermanence of the breath the impermanence of thoughts. Of all perceptions, how they come into being and then vanish.
we might acknowledge the presence of any of the five hindrances, the mind that has the color of desire or the fragrance of desire, wanting something, or its opposite polarity, disliking, wanting not. The mind that is dissatisfied with its experience. Or perhaps sleepy dullness, sloth and torpor. The mind that's falling into unconsciousness. Or worry, restlessness, agitation. A mind that's jumping from one object to another. Or doubt. Why am I doing this? This couldn't possibly help or work. Or maybe simply I can't do it. And the hindrances are supported by and fueled by emotions. None of these experiences are wrong or bad. They simply are. And our task is to simply notice them with a mind of love. Awakeness, love, and compassion.
part of what we learn to do is interest the mind in the life of the body and the activities of the mind itself. And there's a skill to this. There's a capacity that builds. How to be interested in something as mild as breathing. It's not intense, usually. And we do this by being attentive to the subtle details how does the breath begin? How is this breath unique? Please invite awareness to open in what you think of as your hands. Notice how precise it can be. You can notice the middle finger of the left hand or the baby finger of the right hand. Notice the breathing low in the abdomen or in the back. Notice the life in your face. in the ears, in the eyes. And move your eyes around inside their beautifully lubricated sockets, clockwise, counterclockwise. How do you do this? And then noticing the process as you plan for and then allow your eyes to open. Notice the effort involved in opening the eyes. And then seeing starts. Seeing. Seeing and knowing it. What an interesting skill that is. And then perhaps noticing how the body might be a little stiff, might like to move. I do it very mindfully. Thank <laughs> you. 
In a moment, I'm going to pass the microphone to Jim. But before then, maybe I want to plant a seed of... I have a couple of things I want to share with you by way of a Dharma talk this morning. But uh, <clears throat> I'd also like you to be... to see if your intuition provides you with a question you might like to ask about your practice or something you might like to share about your practice. So, Mr. Dalton, would you like the sacred speaking? So, getting in touch with our feet on the floor, rocking up on our toes, lifting, coming down, stretching all the little tendons in the feet. actually listening to uh, Ram Das's book on uh, walking each other back home. If you haven't seen that, you should investigate it. I kind of put together his inspiring words with my Qigong. So here we go. <coughs> this is loving awareness. Awareness of the shoulders, the knees. This is loving awareness. This is loving awareness of the lungs. Loving awareness of the lungs. This is loving imagination of a rainbow, I'm painting the rainbow. Thinking, crossing the wrists, loving imagination of the clouds were separating. Couldn't find a noun for this. 
moving. Awareness of the shoulder sockets, loving awareness. Loving, lifting across. Loving gazing at the moon. Loving reaching across to the corner. How many times a day do we do this? Can we do it with loving awareness? Loving the clouds drifting across the sky. And now, loving, be more energetic, splashing in the sea, noticing the mood change, but still loving awareness of all the movements, forward, upward, backward, outward, shifting our position in space, splashing in the sea, with loving awareness. Shifting our position again, riding the waves with love, calm, peaceful awareness. In an active body, you can have peaceful awareness. And turning. And 
turning again. Palms up, come forward, palms down. Loving awareness of the figure eight. Turning, reaching. And back to the center, awareness, loving being still. Sinking, making a fist, rising, letting the dragon rise from the sea. Noticing shadows, clouds have broken. Spreading our wings, up with the cranes and the herons, up on our toes. And loving awareness of circles. They always come back where they started. Changing direction. Back to the center for a moment, finding our balance, lifting one arm and one leg, bouncing a ball in our imagination, loving coordinated awareness, <laughs> sometimes. And then <clears throat> simple awareness, breathing in, breathing out. Refreshing every cell in the body, releasing every cell in the body. And stillness again. And gathering all this loving awareness in the room, we bring it down through the crown of the head into every cell of the body. Okay, don't forget, Mirabai Bush and Ram Das walking each other back home. It's an incredible experience. Thank you. Good morning, Sangha. Happy Groundhog Day. 
sending love to Puxatani Phil wherever he is. So my name is Avi, my pronouns are he, his, him. I'm community coordinator here. Let's conduct the ancient ritual of announcements. First thing regarding volunteer stuff, is either Ipsia or Misty about? Okay, very good. Um, so as always, we can always use people to sign up to volunteer in the Sunday Children's Education Program in the living room. Uh, this is our investment in the next generation of meditators here at PIMC. One day, hopefully, at least some of them will be among us. And we all have a stake in that uh, beyond just the parents. So if you go to the website, there's a very easy way to sign up. It would be great if you did it for like an hour, even a couple of hours once. But if you were willing to do it on a regular basis, every once every month, once every six weeks, once every couple of weeks, that would really help support this program. Because Rebecca, even though she is an experienced kindergarten teacher, really needs support in order to keep this program going. And people have been pretty responsive lately, and I really appreciate that. Let's keep that up. Also, uh, we have a bunch of end of the year charitable donation tax forms to send out to all the people who have lovingly contributed to BIMC. Could I have two to four people who would be willing to stick stamps onto envelopes <laughs> after the Dharma talk when we get together for coffee and tea? Um, you know, it's like we've got 400 and it'll go, many hands makes light work. You don't have to lick them. They're self-adhesive, self so just, you just need to stick them on the envelopes. But uh, if we had four people doing that, okay. We have four people doing that, it'll go like, like 15 minutes. We'll be able to get it done. Um, another reminder, please sign up for your Barking Dog Library uh, account number. You can do that on the website. Um, and if you have library items that you find in your bookshelves that have been hidden away for a long time, please bring them back to the library. There's a basket outside the library door in the living room. Um, and then just to uh, remind you about our transition project where we are donating things to help people who are homeless get back on track. Any kind of household items we have, I think it's still there. There is a listing there of things that they will accept. So. Please read that, it's basically, it's not household items, it's personal items, clothing and things like that. And then, we are sending out a digest every week to keep you up on all the goings on around here. It really helps us if you at least open it and click on stuff so that we know that you're out there. Because if you don't click, then we don't know you're there and we don't know that we're reaching people. So please think about that as you scroll through your email. Things that are happening, that are coming up. Tomorrow, on February 3rd, we have an advanced directives workshop with Evening Star, this wonderful uh, organization of death doulas who are helping us be real about um, creating our own, our own ending in a way that is good for us. What's that? It did. I didn't hear that. Okay, well, never mind. Um, on Saturday, February 8th, so, so anyway, uh, Advanced Directives Workshop tomorrow, canceled. Saturday, February 8th, we've got a retreat with Mary Stankavage, The Joy of Letting Go. You can sign up for that on the website. Um, coming up uh, further along in the month, we've got our second Sunday PIMC potluck next week. Jim has one of his half-day half -day Kagang retreats um, on February 15th. We've also got Buddhist movie night coming up. We've got a mindful hike with Vic. We've got a mini karma uh, yoga day, the gardening edition, where people are gonna be getting together and do some beautification to the landscaping. If you have any interest at all in that, please contact me and I'll put you in touch, well, contact Misty or me, and we'll put you in touch with the appropriate people. Uh, we also have a winter 2020 class starting up, Intermediate Skillful Speech on Relationship with Doyle. That's starting up on May 3rd. Um, that is all that I have uh, in terms of coming events. If you want to uh, have a Dharma consultation, 
if something is coming up in your practice and you, or, or you want to start a practice, please contact me. I'll put you in touch with a teacher. To volunteer, please see Misty, who is here. Could you raise your hand? She's one of our co-volunteer coordinators. Um, and then I've just also received word that the book group is going to be starting up a new book again um, on February 10th. So if you're interested in joining our book group, um, I believe they accept people for like the first two or three weeks while they're reading a book. Is that right? That is, that is Monday, Monday evening. See Michael. So thank you very much for being here. Have a wonderful Sunday. Blessings on your day. This does not look like a transformer, does it? However, it transforms your generosity into this. And it's pretty remarkable at it. So there's this and there's the one back at the back door, which is a slit, which we started doing the new one back there a year or so ago when someone sneaked in and grabbed it and ran and uh, left a nice trace of himself on video, but we never, <laughs> we, we never found him. May he have used it well. So you can participate in the financial support of PIMC here or there or online making a monthly contribution through the stewardship circle. And it's Generosity is a foundational piece of the practice. Um, it's hard to, kind of hard to understand, but anytime we find an opportunity to give, we get to do this. And this is what we wind up doing with everything, ultimately. And so practicing along the way is very helpful to prepare us for the the great giveaway at the end. Here, take my body, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of it. Um, so I encourage you to participate in that to whatever degree feels really good to you, brings you the most pleasure. I'm chilly today, very unusual for this person to be chilly, but it's a little weird these days. Thank you. Something that <clears throat> anyone who plays my role gets to hear with some frequency is that someone who's been sick says, oh, I couldn't meditate because I was sick. And <clears throat> that's, a, that's a useful and important moment in our practice when when we have a chance to confront that reality because of all the times when sometimes there's not much else to do 
uh, to understand how sickness provides a really beautiful opportunity, a potent opportunity to do what the practice is really about, which is to come into contact with reality. And there's a, another page of these, the four chant sheets that we have has, a, has the recommended daily contemplations from the Buddha. I am of the nature to age. I've not gone beyond aging. Is it true? Is it really true? It's becoming more apparent to me. I am of the nature to age. <clears throat> The second contemplation is, I am of the nature to sicken, to fall sick. Is it true? For those of us that haven't known a lot of sickness in our lives or in our family, it's easy to be in a lot of denial about how natural and normal sickness is. It's utterly normal for us humans to get sick. It's not an accident. It's not, it's not because we've done something wrong or had the wrong parents. Other things are because of having had the wrong parents. But <laughs> it reminds me, a now long ago birthday, my 40th birthday, it was a birthday when we, were, when we didn't know about letting balloons go being bad for the wildlife. So. We, we let 40 balloons go into the world. It seemed like a lot at the time. And uh, uh, but I, I thought that was quite old, 40. <laughs> and 70 year olds, and I mean, they were beyond the beyond. The beyond. And sickness. Um, but my, my then wife gave me the, the, the birthday card of my lifetime, the one that I remember all these years later. And it's, uh, it, it said, uh, warning, this is a dangerous birthday. You're turning 40. And then when you opened it up, it said, the warranty on your childhood neurosis is over. <laughs> <laughs> you can no longer blame your parents anymore. <laughs> Which was... I was very deeply into my psychotherapy, my personal work in my 30s, and it was time to, to grow up and get over it. Oh, thank you, Vic. Yeah, great, thanks. The Water of Life. How many of you read, what was that book, The Water of Life? Hmm? Stranger in a Strange Land. Hardly, yeah, that's highly recommend it. Yeah, the water of life. So I am of the nature to sicken. I've not gone beyond sickness. Uh, it's choked me up a little bit. I was in St. Vincent's three nights last week, this just past week, in the neuro CCU, neuro critical care unit. And after the first night, I didn't need to be there anymore. And uh, they tried to move me to one of the other lower intensity floors. There wasn't a bed. 780 people today, probably still the same, are in St. Vincent's Medical Center. Many more than that at OHSU, more than that at Prof Portland out on the freeway. There's a lot of sickness happening, and not just a little bit of a cold, but bad enough that people are waiting in CCU waiting rooms wondering what the outcome's going to be. I am of the nature to sicken. And I, <clears throat> I traveled around a fair bit on <laughs> different trips to the 
clunk, clunk, the, 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 the CAT scan room, and passed all these rooms, and I'd turn and look, and all these people hooked up to so many wires and drains. And I had a drain for two days. Weird thing, you have a tube coming out of your head down to a little bulb here that's pulling away. And then I am of the nature to die. The, 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 the mortuaries are busy today. Great places to stop and visit. I bicycled. I'm not allowed to bicycle now till summer. Uh, no skiing either. I resent it, but <laughs> I asked my really wonderful, personable uh, neurosurgeon, why? And he said, well, both skiing and bicycling, you stand a chance of having a concussion. And you, Mr. Beatty, don't want a concussion on top of what's already going on in your brain. But anyway, I used to bicycle, and I will again, hopefully, from here to home in Beaverton, and I would go through the cemetery, and every now and then I'd stop, and there was, there was always a corpse, or two or three or five. There was always someone, someone's body, to sit with and do that contemplation that I'm of the nature to die. It's, it's true. <laughs> and then all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. That's a heavy one. Everything I love and cherish, I will part from. Things, ex people come up like my wife and my children and you, and it's a potent reflection. And then I'm the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, my intentional actions, born of my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever I do intentionally, of that I'll be the heir. Is that true? What's my experience with that? And then there's the, thus we should frequently recollect. It's sobering. It's reality-basing. It's, um, it's very helpful in a way. <clears throat> so I had a lot of time, a lot of meditation time last week. Um, pretty drugged out after general anesthesia and then the pain medications, but I could still really reflect on these contemplations. And that first night after a brain <laughs> treatment, intrusion, they wake you up every, I think it was every hour to you know, move your eyes back and forth, shine the bright light, reach out, hold my hands, hold your leg up, hold your, touch my finger, touch your nose. Because uh, they're wondering, they're wanting to know, are you disappearing? <laughs> Is something neurological happening that they would then need to intervene on? And uh, <laughs> the, the nursing staff is so stunning, incredibly kind and helpful. And <laughs> I had an interesting in, in, uh, encounter with a nurse who was very apologetic for having to wake me up every hour. And uh, she was really twisting herself in a lot of knots about it. And I, I said that we had to negotiate a new contract, that, that she had to give up feeling like she was intruding on me because she was doing her, draw, her job. And it was quite fun. She, she would come in and start to apologize, and I'd say, ah, 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 ah can't do that because you're doing it for me. You're doing it to help me. And, uh, but so there was lots of gratitude practice, lots of ability to be grateful for and to the people who were taking care of me. And those first couple of nights, there wasn't much sleep, but it was such a nice, it was such a pleasant time to just lie awake and be aware of my breath and to feel like I had no responsibilities at all. 
just to be there and be taken care of so beautifully. And it could have been, I, I know my, my daughter Tara is a nurse, and the nurses get a lot of heat. People are really grumpy and pretty nasty. But why are you waking me up again? And so one can cause them suffering and one can cause oneself suffering, you know, in, in resistance to what's real. And it brings up in my mind with that the teaching from Achan Cha that I, I always teach on retreats. So I think of it every now and then here that the way to bring our practice into perfect balance is these simple words. This moment is like this. Right? It's like this. It's, it's very mild right now, but there were, there were some times when the, this here part of my head where they did the oil drilling, uh, it was really hurting at times. And I could get knocked out with narcotics, but it was hurting. And to, to just be aware of this moment is like this, and there's pain, and it's pretty intense, and there's disliking. But that, that cuts the legs off the suffering. This moment is like this. It's a moment when there's pain. It won't be forever, hopefully. <laughs> but um, what a relief it is to have that in our practice quiver. Um, sickness is normal for us humans. I can't remember if I heard it, whether it's 16 million or 26 million people in Shanghai, and it's closed. I watched a video of someone's cell phone walking down the street with 16 lanes of width, not a car. And people are running out of food. It's quite wild. And this is normal for us humans, right? Global pandemics are normal. We're doing well to shut them down lately, but there will be another one. And our own sickness, most of us get sick before we die. We've been very fortunate. What a, what a time to live when we have analgesics. I recently sat with a, a friend, a friend of PIMC, uh, Ronald Nato, Dr. Nato, um, as he died, and it was so wonderful that he had the right medications, anti-nausea medication and narcotics, because his death was beautiful, really. May we all be so fortunate to be surrounded by love and also to be adequately medicated. So, this is all to say, encourage, practice with the little illnesses you have. That when there's pain or digestive difficulties or headaches or all these things that we have, to not see them as, as mistakes or bad and wrong, but as the nature of human life. We have them. Oh, and another one that really ramps it up when our children get sick, being around our sick babies. The first time in my life when I understood, please let me have this sickness rather than them, was with my son when he was six months old. I had not been around babies much, and then he got that first cold, and he was sneezing, and his eyes were running, and his nose was all red, and he was suffering. And I got it. It's like, whew, could I have that instead of him? And of course, we can't. Right? Because they have their own karmic destiny to live out. And every parent fears it, of course. And even when they get older, anyone we love, any, you know, anyone we love can get sick and then then we have that helplessness, that sitting in the ICU waiting room, waiting 
for the surgeon to come out or something. <laughs> that sucks. That's really not a nice experience. But it's normal. It's not like it's a mistake. The fact that it's going on right this second with lots of people in Portland, they just don't know what's gonna, what word's going to come out of that, behind that door, you know, the locked door. So it can make one's time in the hospital very interesting and very fruitful. It can make our time at home with the flu or whatever very interesting and very fruitful. Just one story from the Pali Canon comes up. The Buddha and Ananda, his chief disciple, somehow or another found a very sick um, one of his monks that everyone had pulled away from. And the Buddha himself and Ananda nursed him back to health, took care of him. And there's a whole discourse on that to help the sick, to help a sick one of us, uh, is the practice. It's not about getting more and more refined in consciousness and getting up, up, and away. It's down, down, and in, and moving toward the discomfort. So I think that's what was on my talking chart this morning. Any question or comment? Complaint about the nature of reality. <laughs> <laughs> Sickness sucks. I w don't want it to exist. <laughs> Please, here, hang on. Use the mic, okay? No, you do need it. Otherwise... The people listening at home can't hear you. And probably I can't either. Think of it as a gift. Well, very long time ago, when I first was about to move to Portland, a friend of mine said I would be giving a gift uh, wherever I moved. And I moved to Portland, and I, uh, I met someone and fell in love with them. And they... Um, they got me to meditate, which was wonderful for me. And then they got run over by a car on December 30th, 1996, when she was pregnant. And uh, I got to OHSU, and the doctors came running out and said, it's really bad, the baby's got to come out. As it ought to be. So I said, do what you have to do. Uh, can, can you pause for a second? Could someone bring me one of the hearing devices? The acoustics here are terrible. Oh, sorry, I might and not be talking too close. That, that would help too. But even even then, if you wait till I meant today to get one of those, this the speaker is right up there, and it's very garbled right here. Thank you. Let me see how that works. Don't suppose I'm getting old and my hearing's getting feeble, do you? Thank you. Couldn't be that too. Jeez. <laughs> okay, please. Well, at that moment, um, this voice came into my head and it said, be here now, you've done nothing to cause this. And I just thought, you know, how much do we cause in our lives, you know? I mean, do we cause ourselves? And it's very nice to meditate and to realize that, you know, you're much bigger than you're just who you think you are, you know? And you can just be here now and be at peace. And I just thought that's a nice thing to share too. Thank you. There are some interesting and kind of wild ideas about how we cause everything in our lives, which is not what the Buddha taught. He taught that we have influence the contexts that arise in our lives come from incredibly complex sources. National activity. Um, but we do have an influence and we do have some choice, it would appear, in how we respond to the context in which we find ourselves. Right? A bad diagnosis comes, or you find yourself in the hospital. How shall I respond to this? 
we can make the life of ourselves and the people who are trying to take care of us really a miserable. Or we can bring love into the circumstance and have a nice time, relatively. So, anybody else? Please, up here. Thanks, David. Um, like your daughter, I'm a nurse. And for the first 10 years of my career or so, I worked as a hospice nurse. That's why I went into healthcare, actually, is because I wanted to do end of life and palliative care, which sort of grew out of my Dharma practice. And I work in a different specialty now. I, you know, it was time to move on at a certain point, but I just wanted to offer a couple of reflections of someone who hasn't gone through that experience myself, but has companioned literally thousands of people through dying. And one thing that I came away from that sort of surprised by is how despite companioning literally thousands of people through their deaths, I still couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't ever gonna happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I became a hospice nurse with this sort of, I'll admit, a selfish desire to, <laughs> a sort of selfish desire to get something out of it, yeah. uh, a certain Dharma experience, and have increased my, you know, I, I, and that always bothered me that I was, I felt like I was doing it for me, not really for the other people. Mm -hmm. And so that was something I had to work with a lot as well, is that I, you know, I, there was the sort of selfishness of how it made me feel to have this encounter with our mortality. But at the end of the day, I had to question how much impact it really had on me mm -hmm. <laughs> in that way. And here I am, you know, still feeling invincible. And um, I don't know, I just wanted to share that and maybe ask if you had any thoughts on <laughs> how to <laughs> cut through that, you know, <laughs> that tendency to see ourselves as so resilient, even when one might make what are sort of by most people's standards, above and beyond efforts to confront that. I spent 10 years working with people that were dying, and I, and I still don't think it's gonna happen to me. I mean, mm -hmm. What else am I supposed to do? <laughs> well, I can, I can tell you this. I was with Gregory Malouf last Tuesday morning. We had a board meeting in Multnomah Village, GMC board meeting. And I was tired and uh, suggested to Gregory that we sit for half an hour after everyone left because we were going to have our own our weekly meeting. And when I came out of meditation, when the when the bell rang, this part of my hand was profoundly numb, which was part of how the stroke I had had 14 weeks earlier manifested was this in my foot. And then uh, and first it was, it was utter disbelief. It's like, no, because my hands will fall asleep. I'll play the guitar for too long and my hands will get... But no, it wasn't that. It was like really profoundly numb. And, I, oh, and, my, and my speech was a little weird. The left side of my tongue was not working quite right. And I said to Gregory, can you take me to the hospital? And by the time we got the car, got to the car, this had gone normal. And this side was severely numb, like stone. And uh, I was really scared. Because they had told me the chances of another stroke within the next few weeks are very high. And as he drove me to the hospital, I had waves of fear coming through, just abject terror. It's like, am I dying? Is this it? And what I could do was be aware of the terror. And I was able to say to him, there were tears, and, and I, I said, this is, 
this is really scary. And then it would move through, and then there'd be some equanimity again. But then when I walked into the entrance to the ICU, there was a lot of fear. Because I think the organism is afraid. Now, I don't know if one is an arahat, fully awakened being, does that not happen? Or does it still happen, but one accepts that that's the normal process? That the self is really frightened. I mean, we live unconscious of that fear, I think, for most of our lives. And how fortunate for you that you got to do that work for all that time. What a wise decision. And I still think that when it comes my time, your time, to actually be walking that path, I think there will be work to do. Don't you think? Achan Cha, great Thai master, had some kind of a neurological event. And then he lived another several years. And his monks took care of him 24 hours a day. He couldn't speak very much. And one of the things one of the monks who took care of him reported was that he said, if you think that this is easy for me because of all my years of practice, then think again. Achan Cha. So it's a, it's a really poignant question, I think. What does it mean? I mean, it's, it's a real one for me. What does it mean, in my case, to have 40 years of spiritual practice? I'm still in, in the car on the way to the hospital. There's a lot of fear. <laughs> Should I have gotten further than that? Is it, do I have this fear because the practice hasn't worked? Or is the fact that I'm aware of this fear where it exists a sign that I've really been doing due diligence and, and that if I am dying, then I'd like to do it as consciously as I can. And <clears throat> 10 or 11 weeks ago, when they took a three inch chunk out of my skull and spent three hours dissecting their way in to find the aneurysm and dosed me full of heavy duty chemistry. And then when I came out, they gave me a drug called Keppra, which you've come across. And in my case, it was catastrophic. I, was, I became, I, <laughs> described by my wife and daughter, really kind of psychotic and not very mindful difficult to be conscious when they've when the very neurology the very synapses that have to do with self reflection have been intentionally anesthetized and that, that was very challenging now, the one thing that i remember was a, a a state in which it was clear to me that i had to figure out some problem otherwise i'd die and I couldn't summon mindfulness. And it was, uh, from the outside, it was pretty awful to watch, apparently. <clears throat> but from the inside, it was just terror, 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 terror. Now, I, was, I would say that I was pretty mindful, in a way. But it wasn't the mindfulness that can happen sitting here or when I'm not totally addled with chemistry. In retrospect, very interesting. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It was temporary. So, any help with that? I think, I think we're in the same soup. <laughs> Aren't we all? I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. So there's a gentleman with his hand up back there. <coughs> uh, my name's Matt. Robert, I think... Uh, well, at least it, you can expound more on this, but in my practice, uh, I think that if when you felt that fear and terror, you felt it uh, thoroughly, but then 
afterwards, your practice is what helped you rebound from it. It reasserted it, itself. That's yes. where that really helps is afterwards. Mm -hmm. You feel the fear, but then, then profound um, answers come back and uh, really, really is very helpful. It's life-saving, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. when, so the practice, is, you know, you could practice forever, you could practice 10 years, whatever. It's really, it's really how much you uh, take in, how much you practice on a basis, daily basis, whatever. The more you practice, the better you get. And then when the hard times come, yes, you'll feel it all, but then uh, Buddha willing, you know, you will hmm. get through it, find answers, and move on. That's been my experience, anyway. There was a, a fellow, uh, Philip Moffat. Some of you may have read Philip's books or done a retreat with him. Philip, who's a very wise teacher, um, here in this hall, actually, he said this, that he likened it to those, those blow-up, I really like these things for my kids, they're, they're blow-up doll, which has sand in the bottom, and boppers, I think, are here. and you whack it, and it goes down, but then it always comes up. And he, he likened our practice to that, that you can get blown off center, you can have more incoming, more trauma from the past than you can stay awake to, but then some, it reasserts itself, presence and awakeness. One, one thing in this that I might just underline It's not unusual to get really whacked. For there to be more incoming than we have the resiliency to stay particularly sane with. But we can, we can rebound. We can and do. And it's another one of the reasons for community that we then have company. And if we're really out there, we can have sane company help us come back up. We're sure a long ways beyond stress management here. <laughs> and just basic psychological health and well-being. These are really the existential issues. And Who am I? That question, who am I, is so profound. I mean, it's the question. You're out of my peripheral vision over there. Uh, I've been reading about um, kind of meditating on equilibrium lately. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the Brahma Viharas. And I, there's a chapter in the Sharon Salzberg book, Loving Kindness, about it. Mm -hmm. And the thoughts that have been, I guess, challenging and guiding me the most as I think about it have to do with moving from a place of trying to control everything that comes into my life to a place of trying to welcome it and be present with it. Um, and, you know, just from my background, you know, there was abuse in my childhood and I've tended to have kind of a reflexive vigilance toward life. And I see, you know, this kind of affecting that in a positive way. Mm. And what she says a few times is that by doing that, by trying to make that change, that's how we can find 
confidence and security, mm. which seem paradoxical, you know, I think. I might naturally have thought, the more I can control things, the safer I'll feel. Mm. Whereas this kind of, you know, place of surrender or a place of just striving for presence kind of naturally brings about that sense of like, oh, you know, I'm just here. I can let go of all of my judgments and preconceptions and just be here. And from that uh, stance, then the sense of, I guess, confidence can just emerge naturally. Um, yeah, and I think maybe the, the way that that was connecting with what you were talking about for me is the, the idea of death and its inevitability as opposed to you know, scrambling on some unconscious level to do whatever I can to forestall that forever. <laughs> then mm -hmm. I can <laughs> just see like, oh yeah, that's part, you know, that's part of experience too. And that's gonna, that has its place here and it kind of letting down um, or letting go of the defenses that would naturally rise up. Thank you. Just to fill in a little background there, the, the, there are four emotive states that the Buddha described as very healthy. Love, translated into loving kindness. Love, compassion. In love, there's room for everything. Then when love encounters suffering, it converts to compassion. How can I help? When love encounters success and well-being, it turns to sympathetic delight or sympathetic joy. Someone else is having a successful, wonderful thing, and there's like a contact high from it, at least a contact pleasure with the other person's pleasure. And then there's equanimity, which is the ability to be with the polarities of life with less and less flinching. And one of, I mean, the, the other profound polarity is the birth-death one. And we come into this life and we get, we get incarnated. We, we take on a human body and then we go through somebody training and we become somebody and the somebodyness is very convincing. And then we band together with another person or a few little few people and then um, and then we create boundaries and borders, and it's us who will take care of us. Um, but underneath all that, there's the, the certain knowledge that we have that we, try, we defend against mightily, as you were describing, is that it's temporary. I mean, I said this in the introduction that I did earlier this morning. Stephen Levine now dead, several years, uh, at a workshop I did with him a long time ago. It kind of blew my soul. I had a seven-month-old baby with me on this retreat. And he said, every relationship ends in separation or death. That's not a very welcome thought. <laughs> right? But it's, it's, ooh, bzz, uh, but it's true. And so then... How do we live with each other if we remember that? And one way could be with fear and distance, or another way could be with vulnerability and caring and sensitivity and uh, generosity. And, hmm. I commonly wake up before Jennifer in the morning and there's a little light, enough light that I can see her face if she's lying toward me. And I'll often lie there for quite some time and just cherish her presence with the recognition that this is temporary. I'm significantly older than she, 17 years. So it's likely, especially with the last few weeks, 
it's likely that I'll be the first to go, but that's not given, not a certainty. And what a hole that would be. I've gone through partings in relationship before, and it's a big hole. And to be as connected as this relationship is now, and to, to imagine, wow, that would be wild. Um, and I have grandchildren now, and when I part from them and my and my children, there's always this. There's a, like I don't want to go, but then of course we do because life is moving on and we have to live. And, but it does create a certain tenderness and and a certain beauty, a cherishing. And I think that's one of the main reasons to do the contemplation on that. And. Very few people will do that contemplation. I was thinking, what's your name? Dominica. Dominica. Um, you're probably much more weird than you know. <laughs> 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 but, but in your willingness to think about death and to that, because of all the richness of your experience. Your, your heart is probably much more open and in equanimity to that reality than you know. And there's, there's still more, of course, when you get to walk that path yourself. But, but um, to be, even to be conscious that death is part of life, that's not a common reflection. Here's a... Here's a a test of sorts. Do you have a living will in place? Please raise your hand if you do. <laughs> that was quick, David. <laughs> and then I would ask, why not? It's a free document. It's easy to fill out. It asks questions of when, when and if do you want life support? And you can, fr you can save your loved ones so much anguish. But in fact, there's going to be a workshop. Huh? It was canceled. Oh, I see. <laughs> it died. <laughs> but you can do it on your own. It's very useful, interesting questions. And then you give it to your attorney or your loved ones and talk about it with your kids and have everybody know what you'd like to have happen because it's a mess if you don't or it can be a mess. Ten minutes, maybe. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean that you're. I didn't mean in weirder than you know. I meant that as a compliment. You got it. <laughs> we. We often talk about an advanced directive, but one of the things that many people aren't aware of is the POLST system, P-O-L-S-T, which is not just in Oregon, but it's in many of the states. If you don't sign up with POLST, if you have a situation where somebody has to call 911, they have no idea what your advanced directive says, mm -hmm. but they will access the POLST system with your number and they will find out. So you may say you don't want any resuscitation, but they get there. They're there to save your life. And if you aren't registered with Pulse, they don't know what's in your advanced directive, and they will now resuscitate or do whatever they need to do to try to save your life. So if you're not wanting extreme measures taken or that type of thing, then your advanced directive is wonderful if you happen to just become ill or that sort of thing. But if you have a situation where 911 is called, if you haven't registered, those people won't know it. Hmm. Strange way to be thinking, isn't it? I am of the nature to fall ill, to get sick. I am of the nature to die. Those Buddhists are really morbid people. <laughs> I was just going to say that uh, 
after uh, Barbara went into hospice, uh, and we had some two hospice workers come by and are in the process of setting up the, uh, the program. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned was that uh, I have been going to Sangha, so I have some familiarity with some of the precepts. And they said, oh yeah, those Buddhists talk about death a lot. <laughs> I'm Ben. Um, so my daughters were friends with, uh, was classmates with Lola and William Stiles, who were the two children who drowned out at Falcon Beach. Um, sorry, it's, it's not, you know, this, this was a tough thing to even decide to bring up. Um, it's, it's important. Yeah. The, you know, so we've got, we've had a chance to see this, I guess not front row, but a pretty close up. Um, the family live, lives and has a coffee shop, literally like a block between the elementary school and the, uh, the community center where, where William was, uh, was in pre-K and Lola was in first grade. Um, so the past few weeks has been this, this mixture of you know the immediate shock the immediate interactions of the communities um kind of the you know the ceremony we had at vestal and then this what's you know become this drawn out you know passion play you know seeing the the hole left in the community and also the way and this is something that I, i've kind of struggled not struggled but really drawn you know been paying attention to is just how much it is completely up to the community what happens to this family now. Um, because, I mean, it's one of those things that, in, in one hand, this is so abnormal. I mean, as a, as a parent, and I know all these other parents there and the children involved see this as, this is impossible. You know, this is such a horrific thing. But it's also very normal. I mean, this is, this has been happening forever. Um, but it, the clarity of, of, of how much community matters there, because they really could just be cut adrift. Um, and and in, and in many ways, they are. I mean, and not, not necessarily in a bad way, but, but they, you know, people have been talking about, they're here now. What happened is done. Um, the, that fear and that terror, that suffering, that's, that part's done. Uh -huh. And now it's how they proceed, you know, into the future, how the community interacts with them for them to decide what the rest of their life becomes and how they they interact with it, but um, I just wanted to bring that up. I know it's kind of a a bomb, but um, you know a lot of the things we're talking about here are still those things that we place into the the framework of well, this is how life goes. You know, you have your advanced directive. You know, you plan things out, but these kind of real monstrous things do pop up. And like I said, it's, it just it has felt like an interesting, you know, kind of drawing myself out of the emotions. It's felt like an interesting um, experience to see that the way these things do play out, uh, there's a lot of agency involved, and there's a lot of um, this. I guess there's just there's a lot of things that you might not, you know, expect off the top of your head as, as to what right. would happen. Um, but having that reminder there, I, you know at a, basically a regular interval when I bring the girls to school has really made it, I mean, it's very real, you know, in a way that it isn't when you read the news. And it almost is, it almost, it is a unique experience as, I mean, thank God I'm not in that position, but to, to see as it's evolved has been, has been really interesting. You know, a gift in a way, a terrible way. Yeah. The parent, parents who lose a child on average, stand an 85 to 90 percent chance of separation. They're gr grieving together. How do you how do you do this? And our culture is so quadriplegic around grief that we don't know how to step forward and we don't know how to create context and. It's one of the purposes of PIMC. 
is to be here for each other when we go through these really big things. I, I, uh, I really felt it a few weeks ago when I was uh, so disabled for two weeks and in the surgery and the the well wishes and Melanie set up these wonderful the meals <laughs> we had meals on wheels for we had meals in the cooler <laughs> out front for two weeks and we had my stepson who needed food too and it worked it worked like a charm and then the uh, the the financial hit that we took as a family. Um, the community contributed $12,000, which <laughs> got sucked in pretty quick. It's amazing. The, the bill, we just got the bill for the surgery, not the doctor's bill, but the hospital's bill. And before Blue Cross did its write-off, it was $71,000. And our share was eight and a half. But community, I mean, and that, that my prayer is that that's not just when I needed it, but when others need it, that we can step forward and, and take care of children or do what we need to do because, uh, because we are each other's safety net. Psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, food-wise. Most of us don't have extensive, what do you call it, family in town who can step in and take care of us. And we've done this over the years. We've had various, we've had various crises occur for people and really stepped up. Mostly people disappear, which is interesting to me and sad. So I invite you in this room, if you're up listening, watching, to approach a board member or Avi or me or <coughs> one of the teachers, if you need help, there's, uh, there's no shame in needing help. We, we really do need help. It's one of my themes is how much we need each other. <coughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Do they have other children? Do you know? No. Oh, wiped out. My goodness. Every parent's utter nightmare. <coughs> well, how are we doing on kids? Oh, it's 12. Anybody sitting with anything it would be good for you, for us to hear, speak. Oh, there, Danny. This has been uh, such a cheerful and useful discussion. Um, I do suggest next time you put it into a musical routine. We're, <laughs> we're all going to die. We're Little all Dan going to die, that kind of thing. Yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, but I, I also want to put in a plug for the book where you're doing a class on the um, Frank Austin Kosky, is that how you Ostaseski. say it? Ostaseski. Ostaseski. Yeah which is a wonderful book about what dying teaches us on how to live fully. Five, um, the five invitations. Five invitations. And he's, Don't wait. Yeah, and he, mm. he works for the Zen hospice in, uh, in the Bay Area. And he'll he's spent, he'll and, create it, yeah. yeah and I will book. give Avi a link to yeah. send out yeah. today yeah. to the connections. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's a 20-minute interview with Frank, which is kind of mind-boggling. He last summer had five strokes. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a very touching. I don't know whether it's just because it came to me in this moment of vulnerability, but he talks about what vulnerability is. And it's, it's kind of not what we think. It's, it's very much what you were talking about, Mickey, the... the uh, it's the ability and willingness to be open to everything. And we have the horrors and the beauties and the acts of extreme selfishness and violence and acts of great kindness. And, and it's all part of us. 
And if we dare, to the degree we have the wherewithal to open, and we have the inner and outer resources, then we feel, then we know more and more love. Because we don't need to hold back. The more, we, the more we dare to open, the more we can be with our loved ones and friends when they need us. They're there. They're in the chute. Should we keep them for 15 minutes just to see how it would be? <laughs> no, that would not be kind. <laughs> so we're now going to do our closing ritual, after which there's tea and coffee and good people to meet in the living room. And the kids are going to come in and we'll do a final closing song with them. Thanks for being here. Thank you, dear friends out there on the net. Could we bring the microphone up to the center, please? Thank you, Danny. Could you put this down there, Dave? Or over there? Let me see. OK. I don't know how you turn it off. Oh, here. I can't get it up, yeah. Okay, excellent. Ah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Could you hand me the mic? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Did you have a good time this morning? Did you have a good time this morning? Yay. Yay. You did, too. I'm glad. I did, too. What you got? Wow. It says, wow, or mom. Look at that. If you do, if you do that, it's mom. <laughs> Is that you? Yes. I see. <laughs> May I hold your hand? Thank you. Thank you. So it's the celebration of having hands to hold. So give the hand, pardon me, on your left a little squeeze. And a nice loving thought for this person. What's really interesting is that we have a loving thought and then we're part of it. We build that into our own consciousness. What would you wish for this person for today or for the rest of their lives? And the person on your right, giving their hand a little stroke or a little squeeze, wish them well. And to everyone in this room, what would your wish be? To everyone who's ever been in this room. And to the person who exists between your hands, wishing them well too. And now, have we our selected person or persons? Four people? Are, are the four close together? Yes. All right, let's be careful not to get the hair in the flame. <laughs> so, one, two, three. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very nice. Thank you very much. And then, everyone at home get to make a wish too, and everyone in this room 
We can do a huge inhale, which lowers the pressure in the room. Just a lot of lungs in here. Breathing in. One, two, three, blow. Blow the candle. Go, go, go. Ah, phew. Yay. Thank you, dear friends. Please come and have a cup of, sh a cup of schmooze, and we'll see you soon. See you next week. The witch? Didn't bother me a bit. It's, it's very tense for you, but it's not for us or me. See? Sí.